Good morning, hope you're having an absolutely fantastic day. Apologies if I look and sound rather ill. The reason for that is because, well, I fucking am. I've had a horrible chest these last few days that's now migrated up into this part of my body, which is great fun. But I'm half English, half Welsh, so I've just got to shut up and get on with it, basically, and don't whine about having a cold. You're not really ill if you've got a cold. That's the problem. If you're actually ill enough to justify lying in bed, then it'd be okay, but you're not. And also, when I was younger, it was something that was drilled into me from a young age that I would never be allowed off school unless I... I was either being sick or I had a temperature, you know? I used to despise it when kids at school would have a cold and their parents would ring up and be like, oh, I'm so sorry, Montgomery can't come in for the next week. Like, just get over it, it's just a cold, so. Also, I probably hated that so much because my parents didn't let me do it. I would have easily taken that chance if I had it, but. Anyway, I'm so sorry, I'm talking way too much. Studio tour, yeah, I'm gonna do a studio tour today. It was suggested a while ago. There'll be two versions of me doing this video, one of which will be kind of pointing and talking about the stuff that's all behind me, and the other version will be this one here, and I will occasionally interject on that version to give you a little bit of additional information or anecdotes on just kind of talk a bit more in depth about some of the things that are behind me. Also, and I'm so sorry about this, there are three other things I have to mention before I start the tour properly. I'll pop a time code just there. So skip to that if you just wanna see what all of this stuff is. First thing that I need to mention is I'm really sorry for the audio for me talking about that stuff that you'll hear in a moment. It's kind of bad. I had to use this camera and have the camera pointed away from me, but then I kind of cradled my video mic pro in the legs of my Joby pod so that I could talk and be heard, but I didn't get the levels quite right and I'm ill and I couldn't be bothered to do it again. So the audio is pretty bad. I know it's ironic someone who has all of this behind them and, you know, has a <laughs> degree in music technology to have a video with terrible audio quality. I apologize for that. The second thing is that I know that before anyone points it out about my actual studio setup, there's no acoustic treatment in here. That is something I'm completely aware of, especially since that monitor there is slap bang in a corner, which is terrible, but I've done my best with them in terms of tuning them. The reason that I don't have any proper acoustic treatment is because firstly, I'm in a rented flat at the moment and I will be probably moving out of here in the next, you know, six to nine months and I can't really afford or be bothered to go through all of the time to get this space acoustically treated properly because that does take a lot of time. It's not just a case of, you know, slapping some foam up or anything like that. You know, it's something you do have to really think about and calculate your RT60s and all that stuff. And the third thing is it may seem odd that I'm talking about music and music equipment and all of this stuff and there's so little actual music on my channel and there are a few reasons for that. I mean, you can find some music on here that's from like two years ago and is all pretty much complete sh the only kind of legitimately recent thing is that track Cold Feet that I uploaded a couple of weeks ago, which is on the homepage of my channel. So listen to that if you want a more up-to-date version of what I do. But the reason that I don't have very much music on my channel, I'd say the ratio is probably, you know, 5% of all of the music that I write at the moment actually ends up here is because um, the work that I do and the music that I make is, is media composition. So it's what I do. I'm a freelance media composer. So the music that I write, most of it is for something else. So I obviously I can't post a whole load of music that I wrote for, you know, a, a short film a few months ago up on this channel because it's it's theirs, it's part of that film. And the other music that I do is for music production libraries, so obviously I can't upload that here either. Anyway, let's get into the studio tour and I'm so sorry for keeping you waiting this long. So this is my studio. This is what I'm sat in front of for my YouTube videos and it's where I do about 90% of my work. It's very, very close to my bed, which is literally just there and obviously I've got the classic, you know, white girl fairy lights up on my window. So let's start with the most important part of any studio, the computer. Now, obviously I've got Logic loaded up on this one. Logic is my main DAW, although I used to have Reason as my main DAW. Quad core i5, 16 gigabytes of RAM. It doesn't have enough processing power though. I really want a more powerful computer. I'm kind of saving for a Mac Pro at the moment, but that's the computer that I use. Either side of the computer, I've got my monitors. Now, my main monitors are those. Those are the Presonus Eris E8. And above them, I've got my Alesis M1 Active 520s, which are just a secondary pair of monitors for referencing a mix on two different speakers. So you can sort of compare and contrast the two different versions, make sure everything is translating properly across both spectrums. It's also very important to reference on things that aren't just studio monitors. So make sure you've got a shitty pair of Logitech speakers somewhere or a pair of Apple headphones to reference as well. I should probably have some isolation 
insulation foam in between them, but I just don't have any available at the moment and I don't have the space to have them on two separate stands, which would be the ideal setup. Down here, we've got my Behringer Control 2 USB. Now this has got a whole load of different functions, including an audio interface, a phono amp for a record player, but I just use it as a monitor controller. So the whole purpose of me getting this is so that firstly, I can monitor the volume really easily using this massive knob here. As opposed to having to reach all the way over here and use the knob on my interface, it's just good having everything right there in front of you. And it really, I found it improves the workflow to be honest. Like all monitor controllers, the mono button on here is really, really useful for checking the mix and making sure you're not losing anything to phase issues. Mute dim, and then here is where I select which monitor I want to be listening to. So A is obviously my PreSonus monitors, the main ones. And then if I do that, I'll be listening to everything through my Alesis monitors instead. Coming across from that, we've got my DAW controller, which is an early version of the Avid Artist Mix 8, I think. It's really useful when it comes to mixing, editing parameters, automating things. And because it's got motorized faders, it does this really cool thing Thing where it moves almost by magic so that's really fun. The reason that I have that because it would in no way be in my kind of high list of priorities when it comes to equipment for my studio is because my flatmate uh, works for the mixing engineer Sam Gibson who works on pretty much all of Hillsong United, Hillsong Worship, Hillsong Young and Freeze stuff and he got a new one recently so he basically just asked me if I wanted his old one and I obviously said yes but that DAW controller has had BAFTA nominated albums and songs mixed on it, so I feel completely incapable of using it to its full potential. Over here, we've got a Shaw Green Bullet microphone, which I've had for years. I think these things are really, really cool in terms of the actual sound that you get from them, but I basically have that because it's really, really easy just to pick up and very, very quickly get an idea if I'm wanting to do vocals, sing into that, and it'll immediately be recorded, and it's just easier than trying to get a condenser mic set up properly for me. I just, I like having that there that I can just grab and use. Strymon Big Sky, which I've got set up as an IO insert. Now I'll talk about this now. So this is my rack. So my main audio interface is this. This is the Focusrite Sapphire Pro 40. Lexicon MX300 there, the ART Pro VLA2. Power conditioner here, which is cool. It's got these lights that you can kind of flick on like that, you can't really see much because the soft boxes are illuminating everything so much. Power conditioners are very interesting and can be very, very useful. The kind of technical reason why you might want one is kind of like a water filter, but for your electricity. It's a, a way of preventing, you know, surges in current getting into your equipment that has an audio signal being passed through it, which would obviously create artifacts and issues there, basically. It kind of cleans your electricity a bit. My one, it costs like 20 pounds. I saw it in a, what's effectively a porn shop, P-A-W-N, not P-O-R-N. Um, the reason that I got it wasn't so much for the electricity thing, although I feel like that's something that is very beneficial, but it's not something that you necessarily notice all that much. But the thing that is so useful about it is just being able to have everything wired into that and then having a big switch that you can flick on and off whenever you wanna turn everything on and everything off again. I've got my patch bay here, and then this is literally just a blank plate that I bought for about 2 dollars off Amazon, which I use to label my patch bay because this is a really, really good patch bay. It's the Samson Patch Pro Plus. The reason that I got it is because you can switch really easily between normal, half normal, them through on the front. You don't have to open it up or do any soldering or anything like that. But the sacrifice with that is that there's basically no space anywhere to label things. So I bought this and as you can see, I've got everything labeled up nicely. And if I go around the back of this, you see the absolute chaos that ensues when you patch things up. So that's all of the cabling behind my rack. Having everything patched up may seem daunting and a bit unnecessary, but the reason that it's done is so that you don't have to mess around going behind all of your equipment. Now, that rack has got an open back, so if I do need to do that from time to time, it's not a huge hassle, but especially if you've got stuff built into a cabinet that is kind of closed at the back, it's really, really difficult, and you need to have everything really connected back there to a patch bay, so that if you want to reroute an audio signal path, you just take one cable, stick it in here, and stick it into another point, and then you're done. So for example, my MS20 Mini here is permanently wired into the back of a patch bay because I don't necessarily always want that taking up one of the inputs on my interface but when I do want to use it I get a patch cable like this plug it in here and 
then route it straight to one of the inputs there. If you're good to go, you can just record straight from that. It also means that if I wanted to connect it to my compressor or my multi-effects unit or anything like that, it would just be a case of plugging a few cables into the front of the patch panel instead of having to go around the back of everything, take inputs and outputs and just mess around and get confused and all of that stuff. So patch bays are really, really useful and really helpful, but only really necessary if you have equipment like this and multiple things that you're trying to use. You don't need a patch bay if all you've got is an interface and a microphone. Coming down from this boring stuff, we've got a Korg MS20 Mini, which is a really, really cool monophonic analog synthesizer. Really cool synth. Across here, we've got a Moog Thera Mini, which was an absolute fucking waste of money. Now, I'm just going to quickly interrupt to try and give some words of wisdom. Things like hardware analog synthesizers that I've got behind me, you do not need. I'm not saying that they're not fantastic bits of equipment that can be really, really useful and really fun to play with and teach you a lot about synthesis in general, but I basically made a mistake in my final year of uni when I got really, really into synthesis and I spent a whole load of money on synthesizers that, well, I, I don't necessarily regret getting them, but they weren't as useful as I thought that they would be. I thought that it would be really nice having, you know, a tactile surface to work with, and they have been. I mean, the MS-20, I always use that for adding a kind of an extra layer of, you know, I do sub bass on that quite a lot, and it's just kind of weird, gritty sounds I play around with on the MS-20. Um, but things like the, the Thera Mini, which I got basically because I decided that it would be, you know, fun to experiment with sound design. And it was kind of completely useless. I used it on one track once where I basically just created a texture out of three different notes on there. But if you're building a studio and you're thinking about what you want, unless you genuinely want to learn about synthesis and really want to try using a synthesizer, in which case I would recommend looking into them and getting one, but do not convince yourself that you just need to have loads and loads of synths and you need to buy all of that kind of stuff because looking back on it now, I would have got a lot more value out of not necessarily spending my money on those things and instead saving it towards getting a more powerful computer maybe. But that's just me, that's just my opinion and just my thoughts. So. Take that as you will. If you love synths, buy synths. If you're not bothered about them, don't think that you have to have them because you see them in other studios. Here I've got my little headphone stands. These are my Bose QC35s, which I just use for listening to music. I don't ever really mix on them. These are the headphones that I do mix on, my Sennheiser HD215s. I've had them since I was about 16. I absolutely love them. I know the sound of them really, really well. And they're just a great pair of all-round studio headphones. Under the computer, we've got some of the most important stuff when it comes to the type of work that I do. My Complete Ultimate 11 hard drive, which is what kind of stores all the samples and the licenses for Complete 11 Ultimate. And then across here, we've got this hard drive, which has got a whole load of sample libraries. These are my less important sample libraries or the ones that are less intensive on the RAM and CPU. Next to that, we've got a Samsung T5. This thing has absolutely changed my life when it comes to composing music, especially orchestral stuff. So when you have huge sample libraries that take up loads of space and you really need them to be able to be loaded quickly, the way that they work is you have your computer's RAM. So I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM which means that if I'm using a sample library that say is um, 500 megabytes in size, if I load a string patch to it, then you may think that that means that 500 megabytes of my RAM is taken up with this library. You'd be wrong. What happens is only the first little bit of each individual sample is loaded into the RAM to make sure that you've still got loads of space in your RAM for other things to happen. So the first segment of the sample is taken from that. The rest of the sample is still being loaded from the SSD or hard drive that it's stored on. And the idea is that by the time that this portion of the sample from the RAM has been played through, the computer will have had time to load the rest of it into place. This is why if you play a string chord from a big sample library and it's coming from a hard drive that isn't fast enough, you'll hear notes suddenly cut out because what it's doing is it's playing the first bit that's actually in the RAM, but then it hasn't been able to load the rest of the sample in time. So it'll just go like that. That's, that's what happens. So this is why having an SSD to store your samples on is so useful because it basically just eliminates that problem Faster read and write speeds mean that you can load samples way, way quicker than you could do otherwise. And it has completely changed the game for me. I can remember the first time loading a great big like Spitfire library onto one and I just was amazed at how quickly it did it and effortlessly. One thing I will say with SSDs, if you use a Mac, 
If you're trying to do it for that purpose, for uh, sample libraries, reformat it first and reformat it to Mac OS journals, not XFAT, because XFAT was just uh, like a tiny bit faster than the hard drive, but when I then reformatted it and loaded everything from that, super, super quick. So quick tip for you on SSDs. On this, I've housed all of my main sample libraries and the really big orchestral ones that just take loads and loads of time to load normally. Some additional USB ports down there. Now, I'm a bit ashamed to admit this, but on the floor, I've got my Korg Mini Log, which is a polyphonic analog synthesizer, which is also really, really fun. And then coming up from that, we've got this, which is easily my favorite piece of equipment. It's the most important thing I've ever bought in terms of, you know, not regretting spending money on it and getting so much use out of it. This is the Complete Control S88 MIDI keyboard. It's fucking fantastic. I don't know where I would be without this thing. And when it breaks, if it breaks, I'm gonna buy a new one immediately. And over from that, we've got my Fender Telecaster here, which I need to restring. In this bag, I've got a micro Korg. And then underneath is the chaos of the kind of box of cables that are essential in any studio. I don't organize this well enough or frequently enough, but yeah. And you can kind of see back there, there's a microphone in that case. It's a Behringer B1, I think, which was my first ever microphone. And speaking of microphones, this, is the AKG C3000B. This is what I record pretty much everything on, although I really want to get an Aston Spirit, so I might be upgrading from this thing soon, but I will obviously still keep this because it has done me very, very well. It's a really robust, steady microphone that I've got loads of use out of. Oh, and my acoustic guitar is in the corner just there. And that's pretty much it. So there you go, that's my studio tour. Let me know if you have any questions or any thoughts and comments for me down there. Maybe you think that I'm being an idiot about something. I may have said something that's wrong and incorrect, in which case, please correct me. I would love to know what I've got wrong. If you have any thoughts yourself on any things that I've spoken about or any of the equipment that you know, I've talked about, anything at all, let me know all of that down in the comments section. And I, I do hope you've enjoyed this. It might be really boring for some of you, for which I apologize. Thank you so much for watching. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you very soon.